we're going to talk about this image of repentance. I may change this title when I uh, put it up. I mean, if I put it on YouTube, I might change the title to it. But I want to talk about it. Um, Y'all yeah, Matthew chapter, chapter 4. Did I say? Chapter 4. Look at 17, verse 17. Now, everything in ministry hinges upon this verse. There shouldn't be anything going on that doesn't have a direct link or connection to this verse. This is the reason why our churches have gotten off because they have forgotten the mission. The message and the mission. Are you hearing what I'm saying? The message is always the same. No matter what you're preaching, you can preach on healing, but you better get back to this. You can preach on deliverance, but you better get back to this. Because this is the message for the kingdom of God. This is what Jesus came preaching. This is what John the Baptist came to preach. He said, this is what the message is. When we lose this message, we come up with doctrines of men. And doctrines of men lead us to men. That's why people running all over the country looking for men. Because the doctrines of men are leading us to men. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So, look at, look at uh, verse 17. It says, from the time Jesus began to preach and to say, I mean, from that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Rep they repent. That's always the message. See, we're trying to fix people without the prerequisite of repentance. We're trying to tell you how good God is before you decide you're going to repent. We're trying to make God look so good with his benefits. We, we, we're strolling out his benefits. This is what's even behind a lot of the prosperity preaching. Strolling out his benefits so people will want God based on the benefits. Instead of understanding those that really followed God followed him before they had the benefits. The benefits is not why I got saved. I got saved because I was going to hell. I got saved because I was lost. But we're rolling out the benefit package trying to hook folk based on what hooks them in the world. The world is hooked on material things and so the church now is rolling out. Even our churches are built material so that people can feel comfortable. Are you understanding what I'm saying? So this scripture right here is showing people is showing men that this is the message of the kingdom of God yes. even though we have other messages even though we preach the, you know there's many doctrines that we that we can preach uh, uh, the, the apostolic doctrine the apostles doctrine you know doctrine of healing you know doctrine of repentance all these these are different doctrines these are different teachings that we can teach you know baptism all this stuff we can teach that but if you never teach none of that if, if you teach all of that and don't teach this people still won't be saved. You can teach them how to get healed, but don't teach them to repent. And so what's happening is, is we have a, listen to me close, we have a bunch of um, biblically educated sinners. Think about what I'm saying, because this is who you're arguing with. This is who you're trying to tell them the Bible, they don't, they got a lot of Bible, they know, they know certain scriptures, but they don't seem to have the mark of a changed life. Come on, talk to me. See, this is what we're dealing with in the last day. A religious spirit that will claim Christianity, the Bible says they will um, deny the power. They have a form of godliness, but deny the power of it. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Now, what is the, now, 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 Paul says that, well, let me put it this way. What is the power of God? Now, we can say, you can say gifts. You can go into different types of gifts. You can talk about the gifts of the spirit. You can say tongues, say, you know, a prophecy, whatever. But the real power of God was for men to repent. That showed that the Holy Spirit was, was ministering through a man when the people were convicted to repent. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Amen. The cross, stuff like that, power. But see, what we're doing is we're teaching people about gifts. I know people that know more about prophecy and, and have never converted 
but they know about prophecy. You don't think it's strange that everybody has got prophetess on their name. They're doing this because we are feeding, we're doing, see the church is doing what the occult is doing. We're fe people are hungry for power. And we're, and, and we're teaching them about the power side without a foundation of how to maintain. See, we're not teaching them about humility, faithfulness. Take care of your home. Love your wife. Love your husband. Get delivered from lust. See, we're not teaching the foundation, but we're teaching them about tongues. And we're teaching them about prophecy and words of knowledge and words of wisdom. And these cats, because they don't have a foundation of Christ, they go off into seeing gold dust and all kinds of funny manifestations and angels is talking to them and walking with them and all kinds of dreams and they getting caught up on all kinds of stuff and they mixing a little superstition and some Alana Van Zandt with it and all that. That's how we getting deceived because we don't have a foundation of Christ. I, I, come on, talk to me. See, this is what I'm trying to show you. So we have, we have created a Frankenstein. People are People have too much knowledge to repent. When you talk to them about uh, 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 things they need to change, they have an ability to, 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 to tell you, don't judge me. They got just enough knowledge not to repent. Now, we, now listen, as bad as we want to say that was a worldly thing, the church taught that. The church is the one that taught people about this judging thing. Because if the church would have taught it properly, the church would have taught, no, we can't judge you if we're doing what you're doing. That's why the Bible says that you can't remove the speck in your brother's eye if you have a beam in your eye. But if you remove the beam and you have no speck, then you can see clearly to deal with your brother. It was talking about being a hypocrite. It was talking about somebody who was trying to condemn somebody while they were living the same life. It wasn't talking about a person trying to walk in righteousness or uh, rightfully correcting something that was wrong. But because we have allowed the world, but because we didn't explain it properly, we've allowed them to go with that one scripture and we become convicted when they throw the scripture back on us. They got one scripture and they whooping most Christians with one scripture. Most Christians back off after one scripture. Homosexual look at you say don't judge me and you back off. As if you don't have no other scriptures. That's like having one bullet. Amen. And because we have allowed this, we have we people have gotten more spiritual. Listen to me. And see, this is what this is this is this is what has happened. When a person gets spiritual without a foundation of Christ, then any spirituality they'll begin to adopt it. That's why we got Christian yoga. See, the people who are doing yoga, they don't have a foundation of Christ. If they had a foundation of Christ, they would know that you can't mix this God and this God. You can't do it. But are y'all hearing what I'm saying? That's why we have Christian strippers. Oh, yeah. Christian strippers. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. And you want to say, well, oh, that's bad. What are Let's look at Sunday morning. Some of this Sunday morning stuff is about the same to me. Walking around with the shoes on that are, these are, these are Baphomet heels. These shoes are, are, for, are made to look like a goat hoof. Am I lying? We researched it. It's them, them big, them big, uh, big sole heels was created in the image of Baphomet to make a woman's foot look like a goat hoof. Yeah, but have you ever thought about where's this fashion coming from? I yeah, don't know if I want to talk about this. And when you think about it, that got don't look right. Look like a, why is it a big old hoof? <laughs> Our women got hoofs. You remember they took the heel off? What did it look like? A hoof. It's a Baphomet culture. Are y'all there? Now let me let me get on. So the message. It's always repentance. It's always repentance. And this is what's so difficult about uh, preaching now is because 
we know that that is the one thing that's very hard for us to tell people. Repentance is the message. And when you get off of repentance, this is why we have prosperity churches where people can't come unless you make a certain income. Where are they getting that at? It was, this was about repentance. This was about getting your heart right with God to go to heaven, not necessarily to, to, to have all of this, even though I'm not against wealth, but I'm against greed. And everybody that said they were prosperous lost their house in 2008. So we prosperous, why we go out to the loan lenders and get in debt when the Bible says that, that, that we weren't supposed to be subject to no lender? Why did our people get their cars foreclosed and snatched up and tow trucks and all that stuff that they had to make series sitcoms out of it to show somebody getting their, their, their car snatched? Because people wanted, people received the doctrine, it didn't manifest the way they wanted it to, and they went out and tried to make it happen so they could keep up with everybody. And there was no foundation. And so when the world lost, we lost. Now why should we have lost if our, if our finances is in the kingdom, why are we losing with the world? Because we're with the world. We would have never lost if our finance was truly in the kingdom of God. Are y'all there? How many, how many of these pyramid schemes went around in the church? They tried to hit me with a few of them. Had preachers and bishops coming to you with pyramid schemes. Well, see, this is this phone card, and if you sell this, sell this, some old words, stuff like, man, anybody could do this. And it was a pyramid scheme. You didn't get no money out of it. You had to get all your people involved. And nobody got no money but the people at the top. The same thing that used to be illegal in the 80s is now illegal. They doing it in the church. Because when you get off repentance, everything else will come in. Come on, say that. Say, when you get off repentance, everything else will come in. When you as a Christian stop repenting, everything else will come in. This is the trick of that, old, of that old sanctification. It made people think that you reached, you reached a level where you were now sanctified and you didn't need any more repentance or any more work. Now you are holy. They missed the scripture when Paul says, I'm going from faith to faith and glory to glory. I die daily. In other words, he said, my, this Christian relationship is new every day. I have to work on this every day. When I get up every day, I'm going to buy and lust. Every day, I'm going to fight this flesh. Every day, I'm going to try to overcome. Why? Because I'm trying to go deeper with God daily. I can't say I have arrived or have attained. When I arrive, that's when I'm ready to die. So this mindset that once you repented when you came to Christ and that's it, has caused people to think that there's no more need of repentance. So then we, 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 we live a sloppy grace life where God can, we can do anything we want to do and God is okay with that because we, we, we're under grace. Paul said just because we're under grace should we go on and sin? God forbid. That means we should not go on and sin just because we're under grace. Because what is repentance if I continue in what I'm doing? Did I truly repent? Or did I shake a preacher's hand? Did I go down in, 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 did I go down in, in water and get up and do what I did before I got in the water? Then the baptism didn't do anything. That's what Paul was trying to teach him about circumcision. He said, look, circumcision will profit you if you live right. But if you don't live right, you're just going to cut your flesh. So, so, so what I'm saying is, 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 is all of the rituals we're doing, the traditional stuff we're doing, is negated by the fact that we don't really repent. Y'all hear what I'm saying? So repentance is key. You live this life. It's a repentant life. It's a repent. It's, and, and you have to get to the point where you're quick to repent. The Lord was telling me something the other day. I, I, I dealt with a brother. You know, I dealt with a brother. And it was, it was proper. I, my, my channel was right. I dealt with him properly. I was in order how I dealt with him. And I went on. Didn't think no more about it. And I woke up the other day and the Lord said, you know, make sure... Uh, you tell him you, that, you, that you forgive him. You think about he got to forgive you because you had to cut him. No, nah, nah, make sure you tell him you forgive him. I said, well, Lord, I ain't got nothing against the brother. He said, well, no, you tell him you forgive him and you release him. And you, and you tell him peace, put, uh, a, a peace to his family. Now, I'm sitting there like, well, Lord, you know, did I not do the right thing? Well, yeah, but see, my procedure could have been right, but God was saying it wasn't about, it wasn't just about my procedure. He understood that no matter how well I corrected or did the right thing, 
my heart is always going to be open for my, for my flesh to rise up. So he said, no, you, you, you go make sure, make sure you tell him you, you, you forgive him. And I told that brother that it broke something on the brother. I don't know, well, I'm not sure if it broke something on the brother, but it broke something on me. Because I understood that, see, one brother was asking me about the anointing. He's like, man, you know, you know, you, you know, how does it, you keep the anointing flowing in your life? And, 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 and people think it's, it's, it's about a bunch of studying. I'm saying, yeah, I study. I study because I have to. I study because I have a relationship with Christ. But I don't study to be anointed. If you don't yield to the Holy Spirit when he tells you to do these little things, then you won't be anointed. Amen. See, when the Holy Spirit tell you, tell your wife you love her, and you don't do it, then he knows, why would I, why would I trust you with my word with something big, and you can't do it in the small? I'm trying to train you to my voice just by using your wife. Matter of fact, she was praying about some things, and she needed to hear this. So I'm using you to meet a need. Now you can meet the needs of the church. But you can't hear me when it comes to your. Amen. So all of a sudden people. That's when people start hearing funny stuff. And they get off because they're not clear in their heart. I, 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 come on I ain't trying to get too deep on y'all. Y'all you understand what I'm saying. So the goal of a Christian. Is to, is to live a life. Where, we're so, where, we, where we stay connected to God. That we constantly hear his instruction. Now what causes me to miss God. And to be disconnected. Is when I, is when I allow. Willful unrepentive sin. That's why you have to learn. That you ain't got to see, know that you did nothing. Sometimes when you start to say Lord. I just repent for anything I did wrong. All of a sudden. He'll remind you of something you did wrong. See the whole goal. Is to keep your heart so tender. That he can uh, motivate you without having to take you through a trial to get you to bow your knee. Oh, y'all heard what I'm saying. See, many people, they always tell me, I'm going through this. I'm going through this. It's because of the some most stiff-necked people. God's telling them, do this. No, 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 no. I ain't doing that. No, this way. And they go their own way and end up in a trial and wonder why. Why am I always going through? Because when he, when he speaks, you don't listen. I'm not trying to be so deep where we walk around with God's talking to me all day. No, he don't even talk like that. When God talks, it's just an impress. You be walking on, all of a sudden he just, look, just a, a good thought. It'll be, a, this is this, this, something that you know you wouldn't have done. Like tell your wife you love her for nothing. You wouldn't do that. So you know that was God. The devil ain't going to tell you to do it. And I'm going to tell y'all, really when God's speaking, it's during offering. That's when they tune, that's when you really tune God out. That's because see, God, see, listen, God's going to use you to meet a need. But, but we don't want to hurt God then, so you tune out. Nah, nah, nah. We get, we get, we, we, you know what? We, we, we go on automatic $2 pallet. <laughs> it's automatic $2, it's automatic. It's almost, we, we become robotic. That's it. And we tuning out the best time that God is speaking to us. Y'all understand what I'm saying? Okay, let me, let, me, let me get on here. All other teaching should support and back the theme of Matthew 4 and 17. All other teaching. I don't care what you're preaching. I don't care what you're teaching on. It should back this repentance thing. Because everything's unlocked by repentance. Everything's unlocked by humility. Everything. Pride is the antithesis it is the you know have you ever seen two magnets that you try to put the same side of two magnets together and they repel each other that's what pride is it's a repeller it repels God so humility is what draws God but true humility is repentance is when a person can say I am wrong and when you are too great you, when you are too great to tell your child you sorry, you know we can do something. Y'all want to? Talk. You know you because you know we 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 overlook them. Shut up. You, you do what I tell you to shut up. But there are sometimes we do things that are wrong. You know there are sometimes we jump off and blame them for something they didn't do, and then we don't come back and say I'm sorry that you I blame you. Just go, you you don't care. But see that's 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 a form of pride. You have to learn to be wrong. 
Are y'all understanding what I'm saying? Amen. See, repentance keeps our heart pliable. It keeps us, well, if, if, if I want to put it in modern day terms, what most church folk want anyway, it keeps blessings coming to you. <laughs> it keeps blessings coming. It keeps the door of blessing open. The Bible says God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. There's no greater, there's no greater humility than to admit wrong. That's why admitting wrong is so difficult. Most people would, would argue for 10 years and can go to a counselor and some wise counselor would, 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 would make them listen to one another and all of a sudden the, the, the whole thing would be squashed. But together they was too prideful to let somebody be right and, and to listen. Are you hearing what I'm saying? See, pride is a repeller of God. So when people, you know, the Bible talks about that there's a generation in the last days, they are the, they are the children of pride. And they are the people that say God is wrong and we are right. And this is what's wrong with homosexuality. See, homosexuals are upset at us because they think we're saying we're perfect and we don't sin or we haven't sinned. The only difference between us and them is we're admitting we're sinners. Right, They're saying it's not sin. Right, They're saying, no, the Bible's wrong, or you wrong, or you misinterpreted it. Right. There's no remedy for that. Right. Listen to me. There's no remedy when you justify your sin. Right. Because the remedy is acknowledgement and repentance. Right. But if you justify it, there's no remedy. So this is the reason why they are upset at us because they saying that they, they think when we say something about them that we're judging them as if we don't have any issues ourselves. That's not what we're saying. Most people that, that even preach are going to have some kind of issue. We're not saying we don't have issues. We're, we're calling our issues what they really are. They're sin. I didn't try to change the Bible to make the Bible fit my lust or what I wanted to do. I had to call it wrong. Are you, are you understanding what I'm saying? See, repentance brings deliverance. You can't get delivered when you won't repent. I told y'all many times, be praying for people, man, and you're trying to cast the devil out of somebody, and you praying for them and praying for them and praying for them, and all of a sudden ain't nothing happening. You wonder why ain't nothing happen. You be praying for these, 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 these people, and you wonder why, why, why come they won't get saved? Pride. They won't even admit what they're doing is wrong. It's too much pride there. When a person acknowledges their need for God and recognizes their sin, then they will cry out in humility. And God always hears a humble cry. Amen. Come on, say a humble cry. Amen. See, this is the problem that we have is that we have, we have um, Christianized people who have never repented. We have made people Christians that have never repented. Now, let, 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 me, let, me, let me give you some old school understanding. It used to be when you came and you got saved, you got saved on that Sunday or whatever, you got baptized that same day usually, or that next week. After that, they used to talk about something called purging. You know, we, we don't talk about that no more because that's inconvenient. But you will see people, even though the preaching is going on, no matter what's happening, somebody was always at the altar. And they was at prayer every day. And you heard them weeping, crying out and weeping. They were lamenting, weeping over their sin. Because when you, when, when, see, when God saves you, your heart changes. And all of a sudden, listen, the memory of sin brings godly sorrow. And you start being sorry for what you done and who you done it to and how you did it. And if you stay there long enough, the tears will flow. And, you, and, and, and that's called lamenting. That's not just saying, Lord, I'm sorry. That's saying, Lord, I have to stay here in this posture until I feel you have released me. Now, many people don't truly lament over what they've done and they and they still walk in the same curses that they had before they got saved see some listen to me some see 
listen, repentance will bring deliverance. Amen. Just repentance will bring deliverance. But if a person doesn't stay in their posture because they're not trained that this is what you're supposed to do, they train you, shake the priest's hand, you say, you say a prayer, shake the priest's hand, you saved. But not realizing there's other issues, there's things you need to stay on that altar about. Until you're truly, see, listen, people shake the preacher's hand, say a sinner's prayer, and go right out and do what they did before they came. Now, what's the difference? See, back then, when you hit that altar, you stayed there. And as you stayed in that lamenting posture, the Holy Spirit began to purge you and bring up thoughts, issues, things you've been in. When, you, when the Holy Spirit starts bringing those things up, this is where darkness is hiding still in your life. And as you begin to repent of those memories and stuff he's bringing up, you start getting free in them areas. But when a person don't have no time for God and they want a McDonald God and drive-by God, they get a drive-by, what you call a drive-by conversion. It doesn't last. It's a quick temporary fix and there, as soon as something happens, they're right back to their old ways. But when a person has lamented, this is why the apostle Paul stayed saved. Is because it wasn't just where he saw the light got saved. He got blinded. It was a period of where he had to see nothing. If you, if you, if you go blind, you're going to see nothing but what you did. You won't have memory. All you got to see is your memory. And he had to look, be blind. And he had to remember, I stoned Stephen. All the stuff he did. It was he had to lament during that time. To the point that God said, okay. When he's done, then I'm going to send that Ananias. He's going to go down there and heal him. And because we're not seeing these type of conversions, it's very difficult for people to walk with God. One of my greatest revelations I got was that my life, I live a life of repentance. It wasn't a one-time deal. It wasn't just when I blew it and everybody saw it. It was a daily thing. It was, Lord... I got an attitude over that. Yeah. Yeah. I, Lord, I, I shouldn't. I got. I, I got attitude. You know, I've been one time. I was at the airport, me and my wife, and I was upset anyway. And we was coming back from Orlando, and this it's, it's brother at the airport. He said something to my wife, and I'm, you know, and, 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 and instead of helping me, he's the person to take your ticket. Supposed to help you. So he's he. He, he, he thought I didn't know how to work the thing. I said, brother, I'm a gold member, brother. I know how to fly. And he, so he looked, over at, he looked over at my wife and said, and said, said you're a lucky man. <laughs> now I'm already far. I'm already kind of ugly. What do you mean I'm a lucky man? What do you mean I'm a lucky man? So I proceeded to get in him a little bit. I, and I ain't gonna lie to you. I got in, you know, I'm still manly. I'm a man. I mean, I, I feel like that's a violation, dude. I ain't gonna, you, you talk to me. My wife is, just, my wife, and as I'm talking to him about something, he's looking at her talking. Y'all gotta stop doing that. I can dress the man. You ever been somewhere, you talking, and, 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 you, and, and you ask a question, and they turn to your wife. He said, well, talk to me. They have so not acknowledged us as men, it don't make no sense. They think we have no power at all. So I said, brother, now you're going to flirt with my wife right here, right in front of me. So I, I kind of, I said some things to him. It wasn't, it wasn't I, I, ain't, I ain't ignorant. I didn't go, no, it wasn't nothing ignorant. I just kind of corrected him. You know, told him, do your job. Focus on taking this ticket. Do your job. Brother got frustrated. He walked off. <laughs> He, he walked off because I, I was just like, brother, you know, you, 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 don't, you don't be talking, you don't be, you don't be, you don't be flirting with my wife. Amen. You brothers, quit doing that. This is what, now I'm, I'm great, I'm, uh, I feel a turn coming. This is one of the things I want, I want to help you brothers, especially you black brothers, I want to help y'all. We got messed up. Now listen to me before you get, you know, before your, your, your bowels get tight. <laughs> listen, listen to me. We got messed up during civil rights. And I'm, I'm going to explain this real quick. Then I'm going to try to get back to my message. If I can get back after this. <laughs> the man that led the civil rights movement with Martin Luther King wasn't Martin Luther King. It was a guy called Bayer Rustin. Rustin. Bayer Rustin was that homosexual dude. He was the one that talked Martin Luther King out of standing up 
as men and be ready to fight for our, for our rights. He the one came with that. Viad Rustin was so perverted that he was having sex with all the white boys on campus to the point all the white fathers were saying, we got to do something about this, brother. He's turning out our sons. He was that lustful that even Martin Luther King knew about him being that lustful. They even made some remarks to this brother. But this brother was the one that, 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 that went against the Black Panthers. He went against Malcolm X. Anytime that black men, now listen, 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 listen to me, because we've been conditioned with this. Every race on this earth fight for their woman. You hit they women, they, you gonna die. They fight for they women. We don't say nothing about nobody fight for they women. When they sprayed our women with water hoses, and sick and dogs and beating our women, they, we told, they said, don't you fight. And that, that neutered us as men. Amen. Amen. That neutered us as men. Amen. I always, when I was growing up, I didn't understand it. Why are we getting, now you say, nah, that wasn't godly. That was not God. They got that from Gandhi. That wasn't no godly reaction to let somebody dis, dis, uh, uh, disrespect your woman. But that was because they was tell, because this guy was in the bed with, with, with the white boys. He did not want us to fight white people. So he was advising Martin Luther King against any... When, when, we, when, he, when he met Martin Luther King, Martin Luther King's house was surrounded with guys with guns. They were strapped. When he came, he told them, get rid of all these guys with guns. Yet the Ku Klux Klan was trying to bomb this guy's house. And this is, listen to me, this was, listen, this was the further effeminization process where we are the only men. This is why women fell for the color purple. The color purple, they fell for that. And that was this lesbian spirit in that movie. That nobody wanted to see that. Everything that the white man did to our black women, they switched it and put a black man face in her. And it got black women hating black men. To, and what was the solution? Be with a woman. At the end of the movie, Whoopi Goldberg and the girl that sang, Suge, was living together. Kissing on each other. Suge like honey. <laughs> That's some of y'all favorite movie. Me and you must never part. And it was a lesbian movie written by Jewish people. And, his, and the woman that had something to do with it, that wrote it, was um, um, uh, a lesbian. She ended up liking women. And this was, and what they did this for, because they had said this. Now listen, they had said this. That they knew that we cannot get the black race because this woman it's the black woman that keeps birthing and she but she'll still fight for these men. See, they wasn't like they are now how women take us down to court and dog us, do what they do. They weren't like that. The black woman was standing with a black man. We gotta split this up. So they so they adopted the black woman to go into the feminist movement and she and she had nothing to fight against. Making her think she was being mistreated when the man never had authority over her in the first place. Come on, now listen to me. They came out with that movie and women felt the pain of it and that changed the whole generation and it was the further effeminization of the black man and see you brothers don't know that we were tricked to with this weakness as we, we get paid we get points for being weak the more, the more sensitive we are the more people the more this nation on people accept us. That's why we as black men, we have to always smile. We have to always, when we go, we gotta always, we gotta be very non-threatening. You brothers know, you brother, if you and black, you know what I'm talking about. When you walk in a department store, you gotta make sure you can you gotta keep your hands out of your pockets. You gotta make, you, you, try, you don't try to put nothing near you, you don't try to put nothing by you, you cause you know they watching you. When you go on the boss's office, you, We got to make white people feel, un feel comfortable. Y'all know it. Y'all know what I'm talking about. And that's why we go out of our way to, to, to come on. You know. But when they was raping our women, we was trained not to protect them. So now our women think that we are weak. So our women have sided with the system against us. 
I said it. Oh, this is a whole different message, ain't it? They've sided with the system against us. You don't believe it. I just saw something now about date, date domestic violence. So, so now you dating a woman and she can say you did something. I mean, come on. This is further power being taken from the man. I said, this is further feminization. I said, these brothers are going to get tired of women. This is what has happened to us. And nobody wants to talk about that because to talk about that, we'd have to do some restructuring. And we don't want restructure because sugar like honey. Sugar like honey. And one of the most prevalent spirits, prevalent spirits, as much as we see male homosexuality, please, the most prevalent spirit is this thing that it doesn't look wrong for two women to go in the bathroom together. It doesn't look wrong for them to spend the night. It doesn't look wrong for them to go out of town together. It doesn't look wrong for them to stay in the same hotel room. It don't look wrong. So that spirit on the women is stronger than it is on the men. It just don't look, see, it don't look right. And, uh, no, 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 no. I ain't talking about the girl walking around with the white tee. <laughs> with, 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 with her pants sagging and the folded pair of boxes on. I ain't talking about her. She's obvious. I'm talking about they wear makeup pretty prissy, but they have a spirit of perversion. Oh. And that spirit is designed to, dis to further destroy the black family. Now let me get back. <laughs> y'all know what I'm talking about. I'm telling y'all, brothers be calling me and e emailing me from all over the world. Like, man, I, when is somebody going to preach it? When is somebody going to say what we seeing? Why are they trying to make us gay? Why are they gaying all the men? You mean to tell me you're going to stop the press, stop the country, stop legislation, stop everything, stop the White House, stop it all for one dude to call him and say congratulations that you're gay? That's an agenda against the black man. Oh, I said it. It's an agenda. They ain't never done that for nobody. They are not trying to feminize nobody as much as they're trying to feminize the black man. And nobody is talking about it because everybody's in the bed with it. All of our leaders have fallen to it. When I found out about Bayer Rustin, I couldn't believe it. And if I would go one step further, they got tapes on Martin Luther King. Yes, they got tapes. That's what J. Edgar Hoover was taping it and following him about. And you know J. Edgar Hoover was, was homosexual too. And that's why he hated Martin Luther King, because he called him a hypocrite. He said he knew Martin Luther King. He got tapes of him and, another, and some men. I know y'all don't want to hear it. But that's what was behind the civil rights movement. That's, that's why I come. That's the reason why we didn't overcome. We... Listen, we did not overcome. We settled. We settled for welfare. We settled for welfare and a little bit of opportunity. But when Marcus Garvey was talking about let's stand up and do for ourselves, Rusted Boehner, these guys went against him. Uh, E.B. Du Bois, they all went against the man that was talking about you black people, let's, let's do for ourselves. Every movement when we try to do for ourselves, they attacked it with the same Negroes. That's what Jesse Jackson and Al Sharpton is. Yeah. They go, they, when the black people in Ferguson was rising up to fight to try to have a real revolution, they sent Al Sharpton down there and it, the movement was done because they know how to take the air out of Negroes. And it was over, it's over. Because that's what they're paid to do. Now listen, I'm a preacher. But it's something wrong about a people that are hooked on pain the way we hooked on abuse. It's something wrong. We are, you don't understand the conditioning. Uh, me and my wife was watching something. I was, we were watching something about the conditioning and how, how we were bred 
a certain way in slavery. We were bred a certain way. Any defects in a black man in slavery, he was immediately castrated so he couldn't pass that defect on. A black man was expected to get 12 women pregnant a year. 12, he had supposed to have 12 babies a year. They expected him babies. Any defects in them babies, they castrated the boy and turned him and made him a little, some type of field hand, and some of them they used for gator bait. Yes. This is what, this was, so they breeded out the weaknesses. So if you really want to be honest, the reason why they so scared of you, that they, they, they got to do all this Cointel Pro and all this stuff they got to do, drugs and all that, to try to keep you down in prison and dust complex, was because they, we were the strong slaves that they bred us with other strong. They only bred the strong. Because they wanted big strong bucks. And the weak bucks got breaded out. So we are the offspring of the strongest of those black Africans. Think about what I'm saying. And so this is the reason why, Lord, did not take a turn on this message. <laughs> I told you I was studying this stuff yesterday. I, I'll be sometimes I'm doing too many different things, but but I, but I need to say I need to say this because at some point, man, we brothers gonna have to rise up here. We gonna have to rise up if we can't be men. This is basic humanity. Do we have to go back and get the sign "I am a man"? Do we got to go all the way back and get? It seems like we are gonna have to do that. The hardest brothers that we thought made the hardest music about killing. They gay. They are, we were fooled with that. How is it that our rappers are wearing dresses? And no, there is an effemination, effeminization process on black men. This is why the prison industrial complex is like that. Because they know send black men down there in the prime of their life. Give them 20 years for some silly offense. For, for, for the same dope white people use, he get 20 years for it. White boy get a slap on the wrist. Send him down there in the prime of his life when he is as thorough and thorough as he can be with some other boys and wonder why they coming out on the down low and coming out with AIDS. You wonder why. And you tell me, I oh, ain't no conspiracy in that. Please. That's why you better train your sons. Train your sons before they get in the system. And now the black women are the fastest growing inmate. When they say orange is the new black, catch these buzzwords. Every time they, they are telling you, when they come out with them show, they are telling you, y'all going to be the new prisoner. And then they're giving women big, massive years. And nobody said, and then on top of it, it seemed like society has just put all the restraints off of women so they'll do silly stuff and go to jail and go to prison for it. And the children are left. I'm telling y'all, we better wake up. There is an effeminization problem. Matter of fact, there was a quote by a German, was, it, was he a German? Uh, he was a, uh, he was, uh, I can't think of, uh, he was a philosopher, I believe. He said, in order to conquer people, the first thing you do is you feminize them. This is where Hitler and them got a lot of their philosophy from. So they know if you feminize the people, you can conquer them. And so this is what I meant when I said, take away a man's natural inclination to fight for his family. And you wonder why our men have babies and run off. They took away the next, this is what welfare was. It took away a man's responsibility for his family. Look at how many deadbeat cats we got out here that won't take care of their children. Say amen and running around acting like they, they but still got women all over the place but won't take care. What, what, where did that come from? We have to understand we have been conditioned for massive failure. And if we don't wake up, I don't know for how many of us gonna be left. I don't know how many of us gonna be left. You have to teach marriage. You have to model marriage. You have to teach your children to get married. Come on, say get married. It's God's way. You teach marriage. Teach your sons to get married. Teach them to value their seed. I tell y'all all the time, value your seed. Don't be putting your seed everywhere. You have to understand that this is, a, this is spiritual warfare at its core. That a whole race of people are on the bottom everywhere. How could this be? 
shouldn't it be a pocket of rich successful shouldn't shouldn't it be a pocket of black millionaires shouldn't we have somebody I ain't talking about them basketball people they got money to keep you down they, that's why they, the, when it, the minute they become millionaires, they teach them, stay away from your people, get rid of them, don't make, go around none of your people, cut your ties with them. Amen. So what, what is it? It's because we, we, we have allowed ourselves to be tricked out of our manhood. And this thing is so, when I heard it, I was upset, but I wasn't surprised. Because I often ask the question, why did not why didn't Martin Luther King get rid of that guy before Adam Clayton Powell was going to expose them? Adam Clayton Powell wrote Martin Luther King said, "If you don't get rid of Bayer Rustin, I'm gonna expose you that y'all having a sexual relationship." And that's when Martin Luther King kicked the guy to the curb. But he wouldn't kick him to the curb before that. Now, I don't know about you, but I ain't know no straight man running with brothers like that. I ain't knowing that. I ain't never seen no straight man run. I'm, I'm uncomfortable. Well, you, 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 it's homophobia. Call it whatever you want to call it. It's protect the booty up. I'm protecting the booty up. <laughs> call it whatever you want to call it. Call it whatever you want to call it, but I'm protecting this. I don't put nothing past them cats. Might slip something in the drink or something. No, that's all right. <laughs> that's all right. Get saved, get delivered, and we can be friends, you know. But I'm just talking about how did that happen? Because that was the movement. And it, it really, it really let, me, let me get back in this book. Are y'all there? Sweetie, give me your Bible real quick. My battery went dead. Everybody say side note. note. Go to Matthew 4. Matthew 4. Did I say 4 before? Y'all want to go back though. 4, not not 4. Yeah, Matthew 3. Are y'all there? Look at verse... Seven, six, five, four, one. In those days came John the Baptist preaching the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven uh, is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the, in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord. There, that's the message. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and leathern girdle about his loins. And his meat was locusts and wild honey. And then went out to him, Jerusalem and all Judea. And now what kind of message was John preaching? That these cats came out of the city to see him. What, what a powerful message this was. I wonder what's he preaching. God going to give you everything you want. How to have everything you want. I heard a book title. That's why I said these preachers have changed from preachers to life coaches. They've changed the gurus. How to get everything you want. How to be happy. Well, I mean, you, you, suffering is a part of the gospel. It's a part of this life. If you don't know how to suffer, how are you going to walk in the end time? It's not all about your happiness. If we can get Christians to realize it's not all about them, then we can go beyond keep preaching the same repentance and get on to where we grow up in God. Amen. Come on, talk to me. Amen. I mean, look how hard it is to tell people it ain't about you when everything Amen. in their life's about them. Yeah. Every message is psycho psychological psychology. Amen. Where we got to go and dig in your past and go and talk about what your mama did and all that to try to get you straight. Amen. Instead of, we used to say, you know what, burn your cross. That's your cross. Pick it up, come on, it ain't fair. Life ain't fair, come on, let's go. Instead of spending 10 years to get somebody ready to go do what God told them to do. Because we got to deal with all of their problems. And they're not going to work for the Lord unless the, everything is, 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 is comfortable and straight. When the, everybody in the Bible that God ever used was used limping, hurt, wounded, blind. It didn't matter. When God used you, you're going to be, something's going to be wrong with you. That's part of the humility 
hook that keeps you humble. You will never be perfect in God because he needs that to remind you. Every time Jacob would get lifted up, he would. Every time he remember Jacob got rich, he got to Shechem, got rich, got all of his animals and, and got many daughters and sons. But every time he had a, that was a reminder, keeps you humble. Keeps you humble. Every time the Apostle Paul, you know, Apostle Paul said, man, I done seen some stuff that's so powerful that I can't even talk about. Went up to the third heaven and saw and things I can't even express to y'all. Then he said, but you know what? Because of this revelation, a messenger of Satan came to me. And, he, and I got a thorn in my side. And I asked God to take it away, but he won't. Now, it, now people say, oh, it wasn't no real. He said, it's a messenger of Satan. That means there was an evil spirit in his life. That was fighting against him because, and he said, God allowed it because he, he knew too much. How are y'all Christians want to knowledge and truth and then go do something and get a splinter in you and, think, and fall apart? The Bible says Satan come because of the word's sake. Because of the word's sake. The more revelation you get, the more he show up. The more he fights you. The more you know. The more you walk in. The flaw in you is part of the process. I don't trust people that don't bear the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why Paul said, trouble me no more. I burn my body the marks of the Lord. I've been whooped for this thing. I've been attacked over this word. When you find folks that don't bear that, you can't trust them. Don't go to war with them. You don't want them on your team. They ain't been tested. Their Christian experience has not yet graduated. Because when you graduate, there's a new devil. Oh, I know you don't think that the Lord allows it, but he uses devils to prove you. Devils will train you. Nothing like a good tussle to get you right, to grow you up. And if you don't understand that, you'll forever be cursing your trials. Instead of recognizing this is what God has given me to overcome. After this, better stuff's coming. More stuff. After this. Are you hearing what I'm saying? It's so difficult to teach this because we had a name and it claim it. 20 year name and it claim it. Blab it and grab it. If you say nothing ever going to happen, you should have sunshine all the time. And you're sitting there saying, how in the world are y'all missing half of the Bible? Half of the Bible's about suffering. Half of the Bible's about going through. Jesus said, if they done it to me, they're going to do it to you. Everybody that shall live righteous shall suffer persecution. It's built into the DNA of the Bible. You got to go through that. Now, what you're going through now, baby, you got to go through that. It ain't going to kill you. You got to go through it. You're crying, Lord, how long? How long? You determine how long. When you're going to obey all the way, that's how long. When you, when you obey him all the way, when you burn down. Trials come to burn you down. The Bible says, talks about the spirit of burning. This fiery trial come on your life and it starts to disintegrate some things in you. And all of a sudden, when you, when you begin to come out on the other side, you recognize, I don't cuss no more. I love my husband now. I can stand my children now. I don't roll my eyes no more. My spirit is solid. I control my spirit now. But that came from that, 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 that hard trial that burns you out of yourself. These things are what caused you to stay close to the Lord. I've never met a person close to God that wasn't going through something. I've never met a person that only had sunny skies that was close to God. Every time I saw a person that was walking close to the Lord, they was going through one of the biggest trials of their life. There's some things to force you to pray. Some things will make you pray. Some things will humble you automatically. You ain't got to try to be humble. It will break you. This is the point about this dichotomy of life that God puts us in. That it gives a son over here and reign over here. 
and it's very confusing and you get upset and say Lord my marriage is doing good but the children are acting a fool my children are all right but my marriage I can't get the marriage act right my marriage is beautiful but I can't get a job you're trying to figure out why am I in summer and rain and winter and, 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 and heat all the time. And God is saying, this is what I need. This is what I need to temper you. This is what I need to break you, to force you, to mold you, to get you in a position to, of, of, of humility so I can use you. Y'all there? Let me get done. Y'all there or not there? Look at this. And he said, verse, uh, verse 6, and they were baptized, and he baptized, and were baptized of him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. They were baptized, confessing their sins, right? But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who have warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Now, this is the script I've been trying to show y'all. Bring forth therefore fruits, meat for repentance. He said repentance look like something. People should be able to see the fruit of repentance in your life. See, for all of you all who won't repent, then in, in, in a little while, you, you, you'll be limping. Because you're going to have to get, God's going to have to do something. Because he loves you. To cause you to, to, bend, to bow your knee. That's why anytime something going on in my life, I check my repentance. Lord, what, 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 what happened? What, 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 what did I miss? Because I understand that God, he loves me enough that I must not be listening. So he'll speak in a circumstance. And many of you are going through things that you think is the devil, but it's a circumstance of the Lord. This will cause you to bow your knee. Every time I bring somebody in your life, you forget me. Every time. I try to restore your marriage, and before your marriage is restored, you backing off of me. Back in the fire. Simmer. Flip you just like you're on a barbecue. Just flip you. You ain't ready to come off yet. Flip you. The other side ain't cooked. There's another side to this. See, flip you and let, let the other side start sizzling on you. You ain't done. Because soon as I did try to, I started getting some things on this side, you ran away. So you're going to leave you there until you make sure you're done. That's why I try to tell people, stop shouting when you first see something change. Don't shout over the initial change. Oh, they doing good now. They been doing good for a day or two. Don't be shouting over that. Leave it alone. Simmer it. You know what simmer is? You know how to cook you to simmer. Put that pot on there, just let it simmer. Just turn it down low. Mess with it a little bit, stir it up. You know, it ain't thoroughly cooked. It's just, it, it just look, it just starts to smell good. But it ain't cooked yet. And when you know it ain't cooked, that's why every time you try to take it off the stove, it's nasty. It's nasty. The inside got blood still run out. It ain't done. Put that back on there and let it flip it. Flip it on the other side. Because many times, and listen to me, many times what happens is when God begins, when you're praying about something, especially if you're praying about somebody, and God begins to move, and then you get all excited about the initial awakening, you intervene, and you might stop them from truly repenting. You can stop them from repenting. Because you just so happy. Oh Lord, thank you. I got a testimony. Oh Lord, they're they, they doing good. He just got out of jail. He just got out of jail. Give him a week. Give him two weeks. See what he do. Because he's not ready. You just keep on. When, when God is moving, you just thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. If you don't understand that, then you don't understand crackhead. Because, you know, they, they quit all the time. 
You ever had somebody like that? You like, you know, they look, they would a crackhead to train you on the concept of what I'm saying right now. They will train you. Cause they was, I swear it's my last, I swear, I, I swear I'm done. I swear it's my last. I, I'm telling you it's my last time. You let me come in, just let me come in out of the car. I swear. And they get a bath, get cleaned up, get that funk off of them, get a meal in them, a small meal. <laughs> and stomach is too empty to get a big, a small meal. And all of a sudden they jonesing. Do you see them watching TV? They, they can't sit still. What's going on? And then you over here, oh, thank you, Jesus. Man, please. They got to go relapse. They going to go relapse. That's a part of it. They have to go relapse. Addictive behaviors are not really settled in one pop. It takes a little while. Now, y'all hearing what I'm saying? That don't mean that we don't love folk. That don't mean we don't try to help people. It just means that we keep our, we guard our heart. Hold our hope. We hold our hope. Are <laughs> you hearing what I'm saying? Because some of us are so great enablers, our children can't get saved. Let me help you and show you. They need rock bottom to look up. But you're a shortstopper, and you're keeping them from hitting the bottom. And every time they fall and they, they need to hit the bottom, you step in. And you catch them. So they never know how the bottom feel. They never know how it feel to really get on the bottom. Because you keep stopping them. You're an enabler. But one time you have to say, you know what? I see you coming. Because when they hit that, like the prodigal son hit that hard pig pen, the Bible said he came to himself and began to realize, I got it good. I know what I do. But if you keep on jumping in there feeding them, maybe he need to eat the slop. Slop will wake a person up. Some of us woke up. That's how we woke up. You woke up, your panties was over here. All kinds of, you, the, the, the table is full of drinks. You don't even know how you got where you got. And you said, Lord, I'm tired. I can't keep doing this. I done hit my bottom. You know you hit your bottom. You're driving home so drunk, you're blacking out. Blacking out drunk and get home. You're hitting your bottom. Anytime somebody intervene in that, they're going to disturb they're going to disturb the broken process. They're going to disturb your humility process. This is the reason why they came up with psychology. I told you psychology keep you from repenting. I'm trying to help you. Make you think you got a disorder. You got a sin problem. Ain't no disorder. You out of spiritual order. Your sin has, has, has grown. That's the problem. Your, your cup is now running over with sin. And so at that point, you, doors are open. You don't open some spiritual doors. And now that these spiritual doors are open in your life, that's when you start, can't sleep. Can't think straight. Mind's running and racing. Fearful now all the time. Scared. Anxiety. Bipolar. Different types of ailments. Why? Because a person that has, has, has lived with unrepentant sin. And the Bible says sin when it is conceived. I mean, I mean, I mean lust when it is conceived it brings forth sin. And sin when it is full grown brings forth death. And all of a sudden because you live with unrepentant sin that sin is grown now. And what was once just a little habit is your terminator. It was cute to get a little high. It was cute to look at a little pornography. But I'm crossing the line into stuff I never thought. Oh, I can't control, I can't stop, I don't know. 
I done got over into children and what? Lust is never satisfied. <laughs> There's a hook in sin. And if a person lives a life without repentance, then you're stacking up debt. The wages of sin, death. So when you don't repent of sin, you stack up debt just like you owe the mafia. And when you can't pay, they send down hitmen. And the hitmen's job is to torment you, to scare you into paying. They break a few bones and have you scared and looking over your shoulder. Oh, sin is such a bad master. Just a little bit of adultery. Not much, just a little bit. Once or twice. But now I can't stop. What is it? What, 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 what am I having sex with? This ain't no, this can't be real. This, 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 she's under my skin. I thought I could just, but now I'm caught. What happened? Now see, people don't want to deal with that. But see, when you sitting there and you waking up and you saying, I could lose everything right here. I could lose my wife. I could lose my children. I could lose my job. I could lose it all. But I ain't done because Brock Bottom sometimes it's what it takes. I hate to say it. I remember a brother, uh, it was a preacher preaching. He was, this preacher was talking about how there was a preacher, was a great preacher, stood in the pulpit, preached hard, preached, you know, was a great preacher. But after he would get done preaching, he would go have sex with, with this girl, this prostitute. She wasn't a prostitute, she was just like a mistress. Every time he would do it, he, would, he, he said he would repent immediately. He would feel so sorry, so much godly sorrow, and he would repent. And he would get up in the pulpit. The grace of God would still be on his life. He would still get up and preach. The people would get saved. People would believe. He would leave the pulpit and go right back and be with that girl. He would do it and, get, and then he would get sorrowful and he would repent. But it got to the point to where he stopped repenting. He said the day he was at the hotel, it crossed his mind, man, you need to repent. And he said, I ain't worried about it, I'll do it later. Because he had thought, I'm all right. The day he didn't repent, his wife found out about it. Exposed him to the church, he lost everything. And I said, Lord, and that, that, that's what I was thinking about. I said, Lord, what, why, why would you still use him? He said, because he was sorry when he repented. He meant it. The, his spirit was willing. His flesh was weak. His flesh was weak. See, oh, God. This is why repentance is so important, because even when I blow it, if I mean it from my heart, he will forgive me. Even when I blow it. That's why you have to always practice yes. repenting. I'm not suggesting you play that merry-go-round game, doing wrong and then going to repent, because it, it'll run out. It'll run out. But the Bible says that John the Baptist told them there's fruits that go along with repentance. And I'm afraid, y'all. I'm, I'm really, I'm not afraid in that sense, but I'm, when I look at the body of Christ and I look at, look at it, I, I say, Lord, how many goats do we got? Because if we're not really, if, if, if we're not really teaching people to repent, then are we really gathering sheep? Or are we gathering goats? And I said, that must mean when the Bible says, many going to say to me on that day, Lord, Lord. What was his response? Depart from me. I don't know you. I don't know you. You never came to me 
with heartfelt sorrow. And that's why I told you one of the greatest things you will ever learn in your Christian walk is to lay out before the Lord and weep over your sin and repent of every, I mean you gotta I'm talking about it's one of the things when you just go and just think every bad thing you gotta go there why, now, why, now, 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 now if you have a God that's so gracious to forgive you what is it you spend that time he's gracious to forgive you you mean you can't spend the time just talking just rep repenting over the things you've done this is so serious and this is why we have such a lascivious culture in church why people live any kind of way don't care how they live and now they want the church to accept it because nobody's talking about repentance and because we got this we under grace thing people don't know that if you continue in sin you can still go to hell after you got baptized you can still go to hell if it wasn't true then why did Paul say it's sometimes it'd be better for you to never have known than to know and turn back and you may not left the church but in your heart your heart is far from God that's why I say Lord judge my heart don't let me think I'm right when I'm wrong don't let me fake this thing Lord I don't want to fake this thing I'd rather you deal with me now than deal with me later. See, this, this thing is real. It's coming down to just real basic Christianity. And I'm telling you right now, many of us know it. Most of our problem in this new generation, your main God sits on your desk That computer is now an idol. Facebook's an idol. All of that stuff is an idol. And, 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 and we spend more time with that than we do with God. And most of the stuff you're doing on the internet leads you into pornography. I don't, I don't, I don't care what you say. You ain't gonna, you ain't gonna you know, do, do, talk to somebody else. Most people are in the pornography women and men that is the number one thing that they're doing and the reason why Satan uses pornography is the quickest way to capture the soul it's the quickest way to capture the soul and that's why I will be repenting there was times in my life that I remember hearing the Lord tell me if you don't repent and it wasn't no gross sin but he said you know what you said if you don't repent you're going to get up and ain't going to be no anointing on you and I remember I went on didn't think about it didn't think nothing about it if you're a real preacher you know what I'm talking about I got up and did like you know shake myself like you know Greg get and it wasn't nothing there and it took a while I had to, I had to pray for like it was like a month I had to stay before the Lord and pray and fast and pray and fast and repent. He said, this is serious. And then one day I got up and it, it, the Lord was out. I said, oh, thank you, Lord. I understood what David meant when he said, don't take your spirit away from me. Lord, don't let me get up naked. Lord, you got to get up with me. This is where we are, saints. If there's one thing I thank God for that he put in me was a godly fear. I always believed in the scripture, don't fear the one who can kill the body, but fear the one who after the body is dead can cast thy soul into hell. That's my number one scripture. I think about it all the time. That's why I don't fear. That's why I preach so hard. I don't care what people say because I ain't scared of none of y'all. But when it come to God, I, I'm like, I'm, 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 I'm bowing out. 